Okay, so uh, this is the last PowerPoint of the semester. Yoo-hoo! Been a crazy one. Um, so uh, uh, the last PowerPoint uh, had to do with finding the bonding structure, and I sent you out a worksheet and tried to figure out some on your own. Uh, this this lecture will uh, both the Chem 110 and 121 will be using. Uh, lots of it together, and it'll be separate um, uh, at certain points, but I'll split that off. But um, so, and I will send out I, I, on the announcements yesterday I, or on Monday, I, I told you what the plans are, and I'm going to kind of stick to them. I'm a little bit behind already because of coming up with this PowerPoint, uh, but we'll get everything done, um, just like I said, by by next week and we'll all be done here uh, so um, and I'll send out the uh, answers to that bonding I, I know it's difficult I'd rather be with you guys showing you how to do it uh, walking around and seeing how well you're trying to you know get doing it right and um, and so forth but uh, you know so we can't do that so um, the answers that I send you, I will try to detail them as much as I can so you can follow along and figure out what you did right and what you need to work on. Okay, so the same thing will go with this. I will send out another worksheet that has to do with this. Um, there's a lot of information here, and, and when it comes down to it, uh, I will, uh, on the worksheet, you will get an idea of what, you need to distill out of this okay so what we have here and um, so so now what we want to do is see what this leads to okay so after we find the bonding structure uh, the bonding structure tells us the connectivity of the atoms in the molecule it tells us the number of the bonds and lone pairs associated with each atom uh, this structure bonding structure is a two-dimensional structure basically just shows us this connection but it doesn't give us the three-dimensional structure. Okay. When we draw the bonding structure, it is easy to think that we, with the way we draw it on the flat surface is how what it looks like. Okay. But it isn't. I remember when I was taught this years ago, I thought when they drew it up on the board, the, the shapes, the way that they drew it, that's the way I thought these molecules were. Okay. These molecules and every molecule are three-dimensional. It only makes sense. I mean, everything is that we everything around us is three-dimensional. Therefore, the things that are made of it have to be three-dimensional. So, so we have the bonding structure. Now, what we do we want to do is from the bonding structure, can we actually see what it looks like? What can we figure out what it looks like in three dimensions? <clears throat> okay. Um, so, again, back to bonding structure, let's take a look at water. Um, when we came up to it, we kind of came up with this structure right here. But I told you is, um, well, we'll get to this in a little bit. You could, you could also draw it like this, or you could draw it like this. It really doesn't matter. All you have to make sure to show is the hydrogen, each ox the oxygen has two hydrogens attached to it, and there's two lone pairs, okay? Any of these it would do. Now, technically, we usually either draw it like this or this, but there's no reason why we couldn't draw it like this because actually this might be how we see it in three dimensions. Okay, there's no perfect way to draw, uh, but we prefer to probably draw it this way to at least to start out with. Okay, now what we're going to do is try to figure out what the, what water looks like in other molecules. Simple molecules look like in three dimensions. Once you understand the three, you know, simple molecules, um, you can figure out shapes of even more complicated molecules. All right. So what we want to do too is determine what the three-dimensional structure of covalent molecules. And what we're going to start out is beryllium dihydride. And we'll come up with its bonding structure first. So, uh, so this kind of review of what we just went over. So first of all, count how many valence electrons. Beryllium has two and each hydrogen has one. So it'll be two plus one plus one is four. The skeletal structure is HBEH. Put the beryllium in the middle. 
Now, hydrogen's on the outside, so make sure it gets the number of bonds and lone pairs that it usually gets, which is one. You do that for both of them. So now what you do is you count the number of dots. Each dash is equal to two, so two, four. And if the number of dots is equal to the number of valence electrons, you're done. Okay, so this is the bonding structure. Again, notice this uh, method is you don't really care even what beryllium is because um, it'll all work out. Okay, so now let's take this and try to figure out what it looks like in three dimensions. All right, okay, so first of all, um, now what? Let's just let's try to visualize a little bit more. So this molecule, each atom has electrons on the outside of it, okay? All right, um, and electrons repel each other, okay? So when, if you had a neg two negative charges coming close together, they push away a charge. So now what we're going to do, again, we're going to try to make this, think, think of this as three-dimensional. Let's allow the hydrogens to swivel on the bond between the beryllium atoms. So, so imagine, in three, so this, so this is a ball, this is a ball, and this ball, and this is some sort of rod, and this is some sort of rod. And what it's allowed to do, it's allowed to swivel around it. But, you know, we can't show it, but it's allowed to swivel in and out of the screen as well, okay? All right, um, now, if for some reason this hydrogen starts to swivel, as it swivels, okay, and as it gets close to this hydrogen here, the electrons on both of the atoms are going to push each other back. For instance, like this. All right, so let's say this hydrogen starts to move just randomly in this direction. Well, if it starts to get too close, it'll get pushed back, okay? All right, but now let's say it tries to <clears throat> swivel this way again. And again, it gets too close and bounces back. So in the long run, the two atoms, the high two hydrogen atoms, want to be as far away from each other as they can. <clears throat> to reduce the repulsive effect, okay? This is called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VESPER. The resultant final structure looks like this, kind of, okay? And that's because we have to think of this as three-dimensional. <clears throat> okay, so, so this would be looking at it, let's say, from the front, okay? Now, if you were to take it out, if you so, if we looked at it a different way, maybe from the side, what you're going to look see is like this. Okay, so it looks like a line from one view, but if you look on this view, it looks like everything's all bunched up. Okay, all right, or even from an angle, you might think you see it like this. Okay, where this hydrogen is the closest one to you, and this one's the furthest away, and this one's in between. So the one thing that's true about all of these is that these these all these hydrogens and beryllium are all in line with each other, okay? <clears throat> right, the key thing to realize is we really can't draw this thing what it looks like in three dimensions. That one I just had, the angle one kind of gives you the best view of it. <clears throat> but you just gotta think. If you ever see this molecule, you gotta think that it's linear. Now so this molecule is called linear. This shape is called linear. And the thing that makes it linear, the way that you can determine if it's linear, is if it has two atoms connected to the center atom and there's no lone pairs on the center atom. Okay. All right, now let's go to another one, BH3. So. All right, so the number of valence electron is three plus one plus one is six. So this skeleton structure give hydrogen number the outside atom, number of bonds and lone pairs. That's hydrogen one one one. Um, add them up. Two plus two plus two is six, and six equals six. So this is the bonding structure. And remember, it doesn't matter how you draw it. You could draw it this flipped or sideways or whatever. Okay. Um, okay. 
Now let's try to figure out what it looks like in three dimensions. All right, again, we're going to allow the outside atoms to swivel. So the hydrogen and I are going to start moving around. And say this guy starts to move around up and it smacks into this hydrogen. Well, it's going to be pushed back, okay? And then let's say this guy switches up, it's going to be pushed back. Eventually, all the atoms are going to repel try and try to get as far away from each other as they can. And they're going to end up having this shape right here at least from the front view, okay? Now notice the shape looks like a triangle. And that's what how we're gonna name it. But there's another element to that. And that's because I'm from the side view, so you take this guy, flip it on the side, you're gonna look as though all these guys, all these atoms are in the same plane. So what we call this shape is trigonal planar. And a way to identify if you have a trigonal planar is if the center atom has three connections, one, two, three, and there's no lone pairs on that atom. All right, now let's go uh, with four connections, like uh, methane, CH4. We did this already uh, in the bonding structure. This is its bonding shape. Turns out it doesn't look like this thing at all, okay? So if we let these hydrogens flop around, swivel all around in three-dimensional space, this is two-dimensional. If this was two-dimensional space, this is what the molecule would look like. But in three-dimensional, what happens is all the hydrogens can push out from each other in and out of the plane. And so what you end up actually is get something like this, which is really hard to draw in uh, two dimensions. So one way to think of this it's like a tripod with an H coming off. Okay, this particular shape is called tetrahedral. It has four connections on the center atom and no lone pairs. Okay, all right. Now what we're going to do is look again at another molecule with three connections just like we did BH3, the one with trigonal planar, but what we're going to do is this molecule is going to have a lone pair on the center atom, like ammonia. Okay, we came up with the structure before. We came up with this. And if you let it swivel, okay, it's going to end up looking like trigonal planar, okay? But the problem is, is these lone pairs up here are electrons. And what they're going to do is repel these hydrogens. And so they're going to push these hydrogens all away from each other. And so if you looked at it from the side, it's not, it's not a, a straight line anymore. It's actually kind of all, it's kind of at an angle here. Okay. So what does this look like in three dimensions? Well, it kind of looks like what we just had with with methane, but what we do is replace one of the hydrogens with a lone pair. And notice it's still going to have, so this shape, this shape right here is the triangle, okay, all right, but you can see then three dimensions, if all these, if these three hydrogens are sitting on the, on a flat surface, this guy is above the surface, and it kind of looks like a pyramid if you connect all these sides here. And so we call it trigonal because of these H's, the, the front view would form a triangle. And from the side, it would be a pyramid, pyramid, pyramid. And the way you tell is it has three connections like trigonal planar, but it has one lone pair. So trigonal planar and trigonal pyramidal are similar they both have three connections to the center atom. The difference is the pyramidal has a lone pair. Okay, finally, um, uh, let's look at water. So water has two connections, just like BH2, BEH2, but it has lone pairs. Okay, now the way you draw it like this, it looks linear like the uh, beryllium dihydride. But 
if you let it swivel and, and it is hydrogen's fired in the right spot, it's gonna they're not gonna be in a straight line anymore from the side. Okay. It's gonna turn at these columns into an angle. And if you look at it three dimensionally, it kind of looks like what a couple of we just looked at. So here, so this is like this side up here. And if you turn this on the side, it would look like this, okay? But three dimensionally, this kind of gives you the view this is that you have these two guys coming off the oxygen, and then you have these guys coming off in a different plane. So again, it kind of looks like a tripod, but one of the legs is lone pairs. This shape is bent. And you know if you have bent, if there's two bonds and two lone pairs. So if we put this together, this is um, a chart, making it into a chart. This is what kind of get, okay? So these are the number of connections. And these are the number of lone pairs to center at them. And these are the particular shapes. And here's our examples. Now, one of the things I want to clarify, this is kind of messed up over here, but you'll see in a second, is connections not, do, not, do not necessarily mean bonds. For instance, carbon has four bonds, but it only has two connections. So the connections can either be single bonds or it can be like double or triple bonds. So carbon dioxide in this case has two connections, no lone pairs on the center atom, so it's going to be linear. Okay. Uh, the one that we did in the last last uh, this PowerPoint was uh, COH2, and it sort of looks like this. It had, there's center our atoms carbon, and there's an oxygen and two hydrogens. That would be um, it has a double bond, single bond, single bond, but it only has three connections, so that would be trigonal planar as well. And one of the things that you're going to have to do is the structures that you came up with for your homework. Um, for the last slideshow, you're going to have to figure out the shapes of those molecules as well. Okay, now this next section is for just for 121, and I'll probably be able to delete it from the 110s uh, lecture. So. Um, you may one tenth may not even hear this. So let's. So what we want to do is we want to expand on the shapes and the bondings, uh, and uh, okay. From our discussion on bonding, carbon can have four different arrangements of bonds. Uh, it can have four connections where they're all single bonds, all equivalent in energy, all sigma bonds. Okay. Uh, it can have three connections. Two are solely sigma bonds, here and here. And the other one is a double bond. They can have a, a sigma and a pi bond. Okay. Now, the pi bond has a lower, has, has a higher energy than the sigmas. Okay. So it's not as stable as the sigmas. So you have three equivalent bonds and one higher bond. So you have four all same bonds here. You have three equivalents and one higher. Then you had two double bonds, and each double bond is made out of sigma and pi. So you have two lower lower energy bonds, sigmas, and then you two have two pi bonds. Okay, so there's two different kinds of bonds here. All right, and then finally, and then finally, you could have a triple bond, a single bond. Where it's one sigma bond, sigma bond, and then a triple bond that has a sigma and two pi's. Okay. And so what we want to do is figure out how they get those, how the, how carbon can have four different bonds basically. Okay. So what we're going to start out with is the orbital energy diagram and the Lewis dot structure for carbon. So here's the orbital energy diagram, and here's the Lewis dot structure. And they're different, okay? They're similar, 
is they both give four valence electrons for carbon. The difference is the orbital energy diagram um, has two of the electrons paired up and two unpaired. Well, the Lewis dot structure has four unpaired. And we know the Lewis dot structure actually does a better job of predicting the bonding than the orbital energy diagram because carbon can have four bonds. Over here, essentially, can only have two bonds. Okay, nothing can happen out here because there's no pairing. Okay, so because a covalent bond to happen, unpaired electrons have to be paired. These are not unpaired. Okay, they they're just they have no paired. There's nothing connected them. These two are unpaired. All right, so what we want to do is how can we justify this using this over here? So what we want to do is we want to make these congruent. How can this explain this? So how can the OED explain the Lewis dot? All right, and the way we're going to start out is we're just going to draw the uh, second energy level. And uh, the P orbital, P subshell, has a higher energy than S. I know we put them right next to each other, but I told you that um, that as electrons have, if they have a choice between going S and P subshells, they'll pick S. And the reason why is because P subshells have a higher energy. So here I'm really going to show that difference. Okay, so it has <clears throat> two electrons in S. Well, there's two electrons in a one S, which I'm leaving off. And it has uh, 2 and a 2s, and then it has 2 and a 2p subshell. Okay, and what I did here is I drew what each orbital looks like. Okay, <clears throat> so those two electrons are found somewhere in this shape. Okay, uh, each one of these squares has this shape associated with it. So there's this shape here. There's one electron and one in this shape here, over here. There's this guy and another guy that looks just like it. And then there's an empty P over here. And the way that these situate in three-dimensionals is that uh, one of these P guys is in the x-axis, one is, is in the y-axis, and one is in the z-axis. We're, we're just interested in this shape, okay? So there's... Uh, so when each one is square, so there's actually one of these shapes. And there's one electron in this shape, there's one in another shape like this. While there's two electrons in this shape down here. Okay, now one, th one of the things we think happens is the two types of orbitals can kind of combine to form a hybrid. And the first hybrid is where the S and P where one of the S's, the S, I mean, combines with one of the P's, and they form this thing called an S-P hybrid orbital. Okay, so where, so you're taking this square here and this square here and may put, put them together. So now you have the S-P subshell, and there's two orbitals inside it. One that sort of, and then these guys, so are going to kind of look something like half of P and half of the S. And they're going to have, have half, be somewhere about halfway in between the two energies. Okay, so what we have here, and then what you can do now is you have four orbitals, and you can put one electron in each one. Okay, so now what we can do is we can have four bonds. Okay. So let's see what we can do with this. All right, there are four unpaired electrons, two in the P and two in the SP. So what we want to do is look at, we had four different arrangements of bonding. So what we want to do is which structure can have two pi bonds? So the two p orbitals at the very top, they will form two pi bonds. 
Okay, the two SPs will form sigma bonds. So what shapes, which arrangements had two pi bonds? Okay, there were two of them. There was the case of the double two double bonds, and then there was the case of the triple bond and the single bond. Okay, so the two p orbitals will form p, this should be pi bond, and the two sp hybrids will form sigma bonds. And here are your two cases, all right? You can have the two double bonds, so here's your two pi's that the two p's can bond, and here are our two sigmas. And this would happen in uh, carbon dioxide. The other place that happens is uh, the single and triple bond. You have two of these bonds right here are pi bonds, okay, and then two are sigmas. So the sp hybrid is found in this or this bonding arrangement, okay. So where you have two sigmas and each of them will have sp uh, hybrids and there's two pi's made out of p orbitals. All right, the next possible hybrid is where two of the p orbitals, now two of the p orbitals will combine with the s orbitals. And now what you have is a hybrid of uh, S and two P's. Okay, so it's going to have a high, little bit higher energy than the one we just had, because it's going to be more like it's going to be more like P because it has more P in it. It has one S and two P's in terms of its uh, distribution of uh, parts. So it's one. So each one of these squares is one third S and two thirds P. And their shapes would look a little bit more like a P than a S, okay? All right, so what type of uh, bonding arrangement would this work? So in this case, which bonding arrangement only has one double bond and three sigmas? Well, that case was this case over here where there's three connections. So. Here's a sigma, sigma, and sigma, and then one pi. So this can give you three sigmas and one pi. So one, one, two, three sigmas and one pi. So anytime you see this arrangement, it's a sp2 hybrid. All right, the last possible hybrid is where all three of the p's mix with the s to form four identical uh, orbitals. Okay, so there's no more P's, no more S's, there's just four, three SP3's. All of these are exactly the same. They have the same energy. Uh, they will form all sigma bonds. Each square is one quarter S in character, three quarters P in character. So it's going to look more, more like P than any of them. The energy is going to be higher up because it's closer to P, okay, and um, and they're four equivalent. So what case has four equivalent bonds? Well, the case where there's four single bonds. And all four of those are form sigmas. So this diagram puts them all together. So this is our OED model. All right, now what you can, the first thing is if you combine one of the P's with one of the S's, you can get you get SP orbital, two of them, and then you get two P's. The two P's will form two pi's, and these will form two sigmas. All right, and this happened in the two double bonds and the triple bond, single bond. All right. Another case is you're going to have the single combined with two P's. So now you have three sigma bonds and one pi bond. And then finally, they all come together to form four sigma bonds. Out of, out of make sp3. Now the nomenclature of this is is the sp means there's 
one S and one P. Uh, here, the S P two means S and two P's. So the P two means two P's. Okay, S P P, and the S P three means S and then three P's. So this really means four parts: one S and three P's. So that's why we say one quarter S, because if you count all the parts here, one quarter of the parts would be S's, and three quarter of the parts would be P. And that's also in terms of it's actually spatial arrangement. Is is it? It's actually look uh, three quarters like P, and only one quarter like an S. All right. So let's go back to shapes because we're going to see how this all tie kind of ties in. So um, let's add another column, and we're going to call that number of attachments. Now, what is an attachment? Okay, an attachment is uh, or how many is this bond connection or lone pairs? So let's take a look at this that carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has two attachments. It has two connections, no lone pairs, and there's two connections only, right? Uh, for this structure here, there's has three connections and no lone pairs, and it has three attachments. One, two, three. Now let's go down to, um, and this has four attachments. Let's go down to uh, ammonia. Ammonia has three connections and one lone pair, so it has a total of four things attached to it. So that's four over here. And water has two connections bonding connections and two lone pairs so it has four attachments okay all right now um so here's here's what you got so anytime you have two attachments okay so we found we we just saw that uh that this this arrange this 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 arrangement right here was sp and two attachments. Okay, it turns out, and then and that's also we found that it's linear. Now it turns out that these two are correlated. That means any time you have two attachments, it's going to be linear. Okay, any times and over here we found that this guy this this arrangement was sp two, and we learned before its shape was trigonal planar, well, they're related. Anytime you have a trigonal planar, the hybrid is sp2. Okay, all right. We learned that this shape was tetrahedral, and we learned that spawning arrangements is sp3. Well, they're related. Anytime you have tetrahedral, or four attachments together, it's going to be sp3. Okay. Here, this arrangement. Okay, now this is where we're going to extrapolate. Okay, now anytime you will have four attachments, it's going to look, it's going to have an sp3 hybrid. That's just, that's what it's going to turn out to be. So, ammonia has four attachments, just like this guy up here. So, it's going to be sp3 and water has four attachments and it's also sp3 so the number of attachments will tell you they're they're a hybrid okay and notice two well s and p is two attachment three well there's three things here s p and p here four s p p p p and so forth okay and so and these are the shapes, okay? So whenever you see, if you get the shape is linear, you know the hybrid is sp, okay? All right, so this just goes over it. So sp hybrid bonding yields two attachments, okay? And so forth, okay? 
Uh, now down here, it says, okay. So if we go back and look at beryllium dihydride, we saw that it was linear. Anytime you have linear, the hybrid is going to be sp. And uh, so beryllium trihydride was trigonal planar. Anytime you have trigonal planar, it's going to be sp2 hybrid. Okay. So automatically, if you can figure out the shape, you can figure out the hybrid. And that's one of the assignments you're going to have to do. You're going to ha have to get the uh, the bonding formulas. Um, uh, the bonding, you'll have to figure out the shapes, and then once you know the shapes, you're going to figure out the uh, you can figure out the hybrids. Okay, now we can further extend this because we know that um, we can have ex uh, expanded octets. And that's because, uh, so we're looking at valence electrons in energy level of three or higher because they could ex expand or octet. And so they can have other kinds of hybrids. So you can actually, actually have SPD hybrids. You can have a SPD3, SP3D hybrid. You can have SP3D2 hybrid and so forth, okay? So what this mean, SP3D, is means is that there's one S, three P's, and one D. So this particular arrangement, it would be five connections, okay? And uh, this over here would have one S, three P's, that's four, five, six. So this would have five connections, I mean six connections, or attachments. And we'll see that down here. So let's say I have a molecule that has, uh, oh, that has, so here's my attachments. Um, so I have, let's say I have five attachments. Four of them are bonding and one is lone pair. Uh, and there's, a, it would have five attachments, so it would be, a, uh, it has it as DSP3, I wrote it as SP3D, but it would be SPPPD would be the hybrid. Okay. Now the shape um, is determined by how many bonds and lone pairs. So let's say you come up with a molecule that has three bonds or three connections and two lone pairs. Okay. Uh, you would know first of all that it has five, five attachments so it's going to be a SP3D and then you'll go look up the shape um, as a T shape. So let's look at a couple examples. Okay, here's PCL5. It has five attachments, all bonds. Um, so it has a hybrid with uh, all, they're all single bonds. And it, uh, so it has five orbital parts. So it has <clears throat> all the attachments are bonds. That's what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so, uh, so it has five attachments, so it's going to be SP3D. The shape is associated with this. You just go look about on the chart. It's tri trigonal bipyramidal. Uh, like I just said, there are three other shapes that have five attachments as well. They're all going to be SP3D, but they'll have different names associated with their shapes. They basically all look the same, but instead of having bonds, some will have lone pairs. All right, CL chlorine trifluoride. Okay, so let's just start out. So I'm just giving you this and we're going to work through the whole thing. So number of valence electrons is 7 plus 3 times 7, 28. And a skeletal structure is this over here. Put chlorine in the middle and a two fluorine, three fluorines. Give fluorine its number of bonds and lone pairs, one bond and three lone pairs, and then count up the number of dots, you get 24. We're missing four dots, so we're going to uh, put these as two sets of two lone pairs. Okay, then you count them up, they have 28 dots now. So now, if you look at the molecule, it has five attachments. One, two, three, four, five. So the hybrid is going to be SP3D hybrid. 
and then when you go look up the shape it's t-shaped you'll be given um you'll be given the uh sh chart to figure out the shapes all right so bromine pentafluoride okay so let's figure out how many bonds um, lone pairs it has and the connectivity so 7 plus 5 times 7 is 42. That's how many valence electrons. Draw a total structure. Okay, give fluorine its number bonds and lone pairs. One bond, three lone pairs. Count them up. You have 40. You need two more. So put the two on the bromine. Now if you count up the number of connections on the bromine, there's six. So the hybrid is SP3. It's S, three P's, and two D's. And the shape is square pyramidal. Okay, so now uh, we're going to polarity, and this will be both thing 110 and 121. Uh, so, so let's look at a, mo a hydrogen molecule H2. The bonding structure is HH. We learned, learned this previously. Now all atoms have some ability to pull electrons toward themselves we learn and this ability is called electronegativity. So both of these so you have this shared pair here and both hydrogens are pulling on it okay. Now we learned that uh, electronegativity is dependent on size smaller atoms have higher electronegativity and so forth okay. So um, what we want to do is see how what happens to this these pair of electrons as these hydrogen so it's like a tug of war so you have this hydrogen pulling on in this one and here's our their electronegativity and these are kind of like forces not technically so the so so this is pulling on it with 2.1 in this direction and this is pulling 2.1 in this direction you can see that they cancel each other out so overall those electrons just stay exactly where they are so these electrons are equally shared between both hydrogens. Now let's say I replace one of the hydrogens with fluorine. Fluorine has a higher electronegativity. So I'll draw an arrow to represent that. Okay. And now what we do is we add up the two arrows. Okay. This one this 2.1 is going to subtract from the four going in this direction, but it's going to leave 1.9 still going in towards the fluorine. That means that overall these two atoms is that the fluorine is going to have more of the electrons the shared pair pull towards them. Okay. Now you won't have to figure out these numbers. Okay. This is just to show you uh, how it works here. Okay. So um, maybe for 121 I will. So uh, but uh, not for 110. So, so overall, what you get is, is that there's a unequal sharing of electrons, where fluorine has more of the electrons than the hydrogen. So fluorine actually becomes a little bit more negative because it's got more negative pulled towards it, and hydrogen's lost that negative, and therefore it could become partially positive. And so what we do is we can draw these two symbols here. This means partial positive. This means partial negative. Now, well, the way you could draw it is you're going to have this arrow showing which way the direction, the direction of the electrons being pulled towards the fluorine, and the plus down here means that this side is more plus. Okay. Now, another way to kind of think about it is is that uh, it's kind of like a magnet. It has a plus pole and has a minus pole. Okay, so it has a negative end and a positive end. Right, this kind of molecule is called a polar molecule because it looks like a pole. It has a plus and a negative end, sort of like a magnet. It just instead of a north and south pole, it has a plus and minus. So we call this a polar molecule. A polar molecule is when there's an unequal sharing of valence electrons. When you have a sharing, equal sharing, like in the previous uh, H2, that's called a nonpolar molecule. 
All right, so let's look at some more examples. So let's look at BH2. And what we kind of want to do, and there's, it's more complicated than this, and I don't want to get into it. Uh, I would like to, but um, it, it, there's there's more to it than this. But it's just we'll just uh, we're gonna sort of just distill down what we need to know, um, and hopefully people that go into this deeper will um, will see what what I mean. Essentially, what I'm saying is is that uh, what we're going to do is look right now at the polarity of a molecule, but there's also polarity of bonds. Right now, we're just going to end up looking at the polarity of a whole molecule, but the polarity of the bonds are going to help affect the polarity of a molecule. Okay, so like in a previous example where the two hydrogens are pulling on, you have the two hydrogens pulling on the beryllium in equal force, and therefore, the beryllium, in a sense, uh, is equally shared. So this would be a nonpolar molecule. And again, let's replace one of the hydrogen with fluorine. And we'll get an unequal share of electrons towards the fluorine. And so this would be a polar molecule. So the top one is nonpolar, the bottom one is polar. And what determines the polarity of these molecules is the difference in the atoms that are attached in the molecule. All I had to do is change this guy over here or this guy over here and you could change the polarity. Okay, so this polar molecule and you kind of can draw like this, uh, plus and minus. You don't have to put these guys, these, these are deltas, you could just put plus and minus. But, uh, but it's not a full plus, it's partial plus and partial minus. All right, so what we have is this thing called polarity. And polarity is the overall charge distribution of charged electrons on a covalent molecule. So how are, how are the electrons shared on this molecule? If they're unequally shared, like in this case, we call it a polar molecule. If they're equally shared, like we saw with two H's attached, that's called nonpolar. And again, on what affects, what makes this happen, the polarity of this, what determines the polarity is the, is the atoms attached and their electronegativity. Okay, now so let's look at water now. So set up, draw it, and if you notice, it kind of looks like what we saw with beryllium dihydride. And it looks like this molecule should be nonpolar. But the key thing, it's not true, is because water is not linear. From this view, okay, all right, it looks like they cancel out. But if we turn it on its side, we get this, okay? And this is what determines if it's polar or not. Okay, so what I'm do do here is I'm gonna draw and this if this goes over your head that's fine but I hopefully some of you will be able to pick it up and it's, it relates to vectors if anybody's vectors but hopefully you maybe get to get an idea how it works okay so um and I'll, I'll try to describe it in more an analogy in a second as well so uh, so here's your oxygen and your hydrogens pulling on the electrons let's say okay down not straight across anymore, but down. Now, one way to kind of think about it is like, s suppose you have, in first case uh, with beryllium dihydride, you have two people equal heights, pull, um, same height as you, and they're pulling on your arms, okay? Uh, what's, and they have equal strength. Okay, you're gonna, not going to go anywhere. Okay, but now let's do this. Let's have... Uh, two little people, maybe about two feet tall, okay, have them pull on your arms. Are you going to move then? Okay, yes, you are, all right? You are going to be pulled down, okay? Because they're not pulling straight out from you anymore. They're pulling it, they're straight, pulling straight out, but they're also pulling down. So overall effect is you're being pulled down, okay? So the way that you can draw it out is you have these two guys pulling on you 
and there's there's a part that's pulling straight across okay they're both pulling out from you but they're also both pulling down from you okay the pulling out parts are going to cancel out okay okay but the pulling down parts are actually going to add up because they're both pulling down and so overall the electrons are being pulled down or up okay depending on the strength okay so overall this molecule is not nonpolar because the electrons are actually being pulled down or well actually up but the way that we drew it here they're being pulled down so what made this a polar molecule was not the atoms that were attached but was the shape of the molecule the bent shape so water has basically has this it has a plus down here and then minus up here okay All right so two reason why that they term a polarity of molecule one is the atoms that are attached and two the uh the shape of the molecule now what i want to do is i want to give you a shortcut a way that you can identify um if a molecule is polar or nonpolar and there's many shortcuts in chemistry this just gives you idea and what we're going to do is come up with different two different ways to identify to identify if a molecule is polar or not it doesn't tell me the reason it just gives me a trick to figure out okay okay and this tells you the two things actually determine now the tricks trick number one if you're giving a bonding structure bonding structure if the center atom of a molecule has more than one thing attached okay the quotation it will be a polar molecule or it's converse if the center have atom has same things attached it'll be nonpolar so let's see if this works so let's look at BEH2 and BEHF okay so in a case of BEHF all right um it has two different things attached to the center atom okay there's an H and an F attached to it and we found that it was a polar okay so so it has different things attached and it's polar okay so it turns out that is true okay all right for BEH2 okay the beryllium had the same atoms attached to hydrogen and it was nonpolar so same atom same things attached nonpolar different things attached polar okay seems to be working now let's look at water h2o at first glance it looks like water has the same things attached to the hydrogen hydrogen atoms but notice that also attached to the hydrogen oxygen i mean are lone pairs so that's why i put things in quotation that things could be the lone pairs or are atoms so water so the oxygen has more than one type of thing it has lone pairs and it has bonds we found out that it was polar and guess what it has different things attached to it okay so what you're going to have to do um uh with the bonding structures that i gave you for homework you're going to have to first figure out what the shape of them and then what you're going to have to do is figure out the polarity of the molecules using this technique okay all right so let's go over some and so these will be some of them uh this structure here is nonpolar. notice it has the carbon has all four things attached same things attached ammonia okay it has uh it has bonds and it has lone pairs attached so it's polar okay uh carbon dioxide is nonpolar because it only has oxygens attached this guy is polar because this carbon has oxygens and hydrogens attached and this this 
this molecule is polar as well because this carbon has nitrogen and hydrogen. Now, when you we're looking at the lone pairs, you're just looking at the lone pairs on the center atom. These guys out here on the oxygens or nitrogens have no effect on the shape or the polarity. Okay. So these lone pairs here determine the shape. So it has two different things. I mean, it determines the shape and the polarity. So the shape is trigonal, pyramidal, and the polarity is polar because it has different things attached to the center atom, lone pairs and bonds. This is also, this is trigonal planar because it has three things attached and no lone pairs. But of those three things, um, they're different. So this is going to be polar. Okay, trick number two. Um, the second method is if you're only given the molecular formula specifically for organic molecules. And what is an organic molecule? Well, if you take 111, you'll hear about these, but they, or if you go into organic chemistry, but these kinds of molecules have lots of carbons, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogens. So the trick is this. If the ratio of carbons to oxygens is where there are more than three carbons per one oxygen, the molecule is probably nonpolar. So a couple examples is this. So here's glucose, C6H12O6. The ratio is six carbons to six oxygen, which is the same as one carbon to one oxygen. And that the ratio is less than one, three to one. So this is a polar molecule. All right, here's a molecule. This is a molecule of, this would be a fat molecule. You don't have to know that, but here's that formula. The ratio is eight car 18 carbons to two oxygens, or 9 to 1. So this is greater than 3 to 1, so this is a nonpolar molecule. Now, if you take 111, you'll be seeing a lot of this, and it's really important uh, in terms of polarity. 